If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. How do we look? We're sharing with him and all these books. Okay. Great. I'm going to go check outside, make sure there's nobody out there. And I think there's two people out there. Two more? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I thought the Q&A was happening. Is that the same suit you wore in the movie? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, and uh, my that is the uh, court. Yes, the court was mine. <laughs> Sam's jacket. Yeah, it's my, it's my lucky so court suit. So <laughs> I always lose. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a website on your back? <laughs> no, I took that off. Oh, no. <laughs> I used to have the, the Live Free or Dance. My website is not there anymore, but if people wanted to see all the content, has moved over to TheDerekJ.com. All right, last chance for a uh, raffle drawing on this poster. Anybody else? Buy some tickets. I have one each. Okay, I'm going to mix them up. In a fedora. There are only five of these posters that exist. We gave away one of them at the original screening five years ago in Keene. It was Michelle Seven. Oh, wow. Yeah. Who appears a few times. I know. All right. Wait, who doesn't yeah. appear? That's what Got your tickets out? <laughs> wait, yeah, wait, hold, hold on. on. <laughs> I don't know where I can put mine. I can find it. Oh, oh, okay. Everyone ready? Uh, okay, the number is six, three, six, eight, nine, nine. Woo! Really, Carol? Yeah. First of all, I want to say thank you to this wonderful venue, uh, the Seacoast Repertory Theater, for having us here tonight. So a round of applause, if you don't mind, for the, uh, the folks yeah. here. As you already know, they take cryptocurrency, which uh, is one of those things that has exploded since your movie. I don't know if any of us were really into it at all at, at the time that Sure, the movie was, was made in 2012, so there yeah. were definitely people using Bitcoin then. But were you? Yeah. Okay, I just don't remember. Anyway, it's been five years. Um, I can probably ask some questions, but let's start with you guys. Uh, Daryl, and we're going to repeat the question just for the uh, purpose of uh, the audio recording. So I actually have a bunch of questions. So Not that we can, need to with Daryl. You, you can uh, you know, intermittently just come back to me and say, Daryl, okay. follow up. Uh, so the first question, uh, what are your thoughts five years after, uh, because it's been almost exactly five years since the original screening, uh, but thoughts five years after, just a, a broad overview, and then I have more specifics that I could ask. You first. That was going to be my question for you, too. Um, I mean, wow, what a wonderful film. I mean, it has touched so many people that have communicated to us over the years that, I mean, not just those of you here tonight, but some folks mentioned it tonight, that this was a, uh, this movie was a major reason, if not a linchpin, for multiple people moving to New Hampshire. I mean, I don't know how many it's been, but you, you figure if if somebody's going to tell you, if a few people tell you something, it's probably affecting a whole lot more than that. So uh, one of the goals, I think, of the, the movie originally when you and Bo and I uh, were all talking about it was that this would be something that would attract people here to really show that the New Hampshire liberty movement, this migration that has been happening, is more than just about you know getting active in the state house. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I do that too, as you do, Daryl. 
uh, with Liberty Lobby, but that, that action, that in the streets, uh, that stuff is what really attracted me to come here originally when it was the original movers to Keene. And uh, I don't know, you can share your thoughts too. Five years later, uh, the, the most remarkable thing to me is um, the bravery that everyone showed. Um, seeing Tally go down to the, to the ground and, and peacefully resist arrest. And some of those things look crazy to me that uh, I wouldn't do them today. Like I have a, a hindsight um, that suggests that's too dangerous now. And that's that's weird, but that's the that's the situation. Just looking at this, it's almost like uh, another person's life. Um, and another thing is, five years later, I'm like reminded that so much more has happened since then that there really is a need to encapsulate that into a, a shorter, you know, like another movie sort of thing where collect all the activism that's been happening because it hasn't stopped in 2012, right? It's only gotten more. The Free State Project reached its goal of 20,000 signers, and more activism continues to happen every day. It, it, it does, and uh, but it's not the same, right? Like, the zeitgeist has definitely changed. And I think there are some people who've moved uh, to New Hampshire expecting that the, the feel of this movie, which I think perfectly encapsulates the feeling of what was happening at that time, it really does uh, capture the zeitgeist uh, for that 20. 2011, 2012, 20, and you know, even as far back as 2000 and, and uh, the 420s and things like that. Uh, but I think that uh, people expect that it's going to be the same. And people change. You know, we were talking about this on Free Talk Live today that you describe this as your kind of coming of age movie, basically. Yeah, like there's your journey. a certain stupidity and bravery that comes with being like 21, and I just didn't know any better. I didn't. Um, I couldn't see the future ahead of me, so it was just all what matters right now. And I feel like, uh, I, I feel embarrassed saying this, but I feel more adult looking back and being like, that was dumb. You shouldn't have done that. And, you know, what can you do? It's like, do you have any regrets? No, no, I don't okay. regret it. I had to do what I had to do at the time, and that's what was right for me then. Yeah, it's why, who, it's right why you me. are who you are right now. Right? Yeah, but it's not right for me now. I wouldn't do those things or act in that way. It's hard to run now, a store five change. days a week if you're sitting in a jail cell. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and there's always room for a new batch of people who are interested in doing these things, but uh, uh, we all kind of mellowed out. I saw Judge Burke the other day, actually. Uh, we no were way. At, where? Yeah. No, it was just literally this week. Uh, I was out at Route 101 Local Goods, which is where the Bitcoin vending machine is. He came into the it, store? Well, I don't know if he went into the store because I was eating at the Vietnamese food truck that was it's right next door, and they take Bitcoin, too. Um, and yeah. so uh, I'm sitting there eating, and I look over, and oh, that's, that's Judge Burke. And uh, I said Ed Burke, because he and I are on a first-name basis. And so uh, I went up and I said hello to him, and he's looking good. He's in good shape. I think he's probably still working out at uh, the YMCA, which is where Mark encountered him a few times. And, you know, I, sh I shook his hand, and we kind of caught up, and he's uh, semi-retired now, Judge Burke. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the new guy's better or worse, though. That's the thing. Hmm. All right, so uh, questions back from uh, the audience. We got a gentleman in the back there. So one of my pet peeves is in New Hampshire, it's a privilege to own a, uh, to have a driver's license on a right. Mm. What what traffic violation did you do that made you lose your license? Let's, I'm going to just re-ask the question. Uh, driving privilege, not a right in New Hampshire like all states, what did you do to lose that? I don't remember, to be totally honest. I think it was a speeding ticket that I never looked at again or, or an unpaid parking ticket or something, and which I would have fought. I mean, I like going to court, but... I don't remember, um, but they, I had a PA license at the time, and so I know that the judge couldn't restrict my um, travel in all the other 49 states, only New Hampshire. So uh, once I left, I was safe. That's why you saw me driving through Vermont. So, but there was some sort of a violation. Uh, allegedly, I don't even know. I mean, what the, the I, I believe they. For the passenger used to say, it's, you no longer have that right. Yeah. I'm curious to know what your uh, pet peeve about it is, as you, as you call it, about the privilege to drive. What, what I think we all should have the right to drive. It shouldn't be a privilege. Yeah. 
I agree with him yeah. that uh, we should have the right to travel and that it, you shouldn't have to ask government permission. And that's part here, of the here. theme of this movie is that you shouldn't have to ask uh, these people's permission. And who are they anyway? You know, in fact, I think um, since this movie, there's been an activist who's a mover for the Free State Project who has been imprisoned. I think it was prison, not even jail, for, yeah, for two years for the crime of driving without state permission. That's right, Abel yeah. Freeman. These are good oh, questions, man. but this is more of a court kind of general question. So I'd like to keep things focused, if you don't mind, on Derek and the movie. And I appreciate where you're coming from, well, and we can talk afterwards about well, that. Well, also, just to that point, that happened to you, where you, you did appeal in the movie, and you were expecting another 30 days at least out on the outside to prepare for the next appeal. Yeah. But instead, they <laughs> you, took you, you get to away. Sit. Yeah, and you had to prepare from jail. Uh, let's uh, get some other f questions in here. I got Daryl with another one, but uh, anybody else that has one first? Okay, Daryl. Uh, so I'm glad you mentioned the no trespass order. Uh, you actually received several of them throughout the film. Uh, so if you can recall which ones you have received and how many of those are still active <laughs> that Gosh, you are aware of. Liquor store is still so active, for sure. The question is, uh, how many bans are still active. I think it's only the liquor store. I'm banned from all New Hampshire liquor stores for life. The other ones had some kind of limit to them, I think like a year or two. I think you're right about that, but we'd have to review the paperwork. I mean, it just, uh, since the liquor store incident, we've actually challenged it uh, in Keene. So one of the oh, things good. that's happened since then, and it's probably been three years or something like that since we did, but a group of us, including me, went to the Keene liquor store and sang the Shire Choir carols, right. which it was so fun to hear people singing during the uh, the movie. Like, kind of, It's kind of like the callbacks with uh, yeah. uh, Rocky, Rocky Horror. So yeah. that was kind of fun. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they ignored us, and they didn't do anything about it, which is what they should have done in the first place. It was one of those things where they, they're making it up. And making they, it up as they go along. Yeah. In fact, I know Daryl's been doing some research on that uh, no trespass order. And what was it, Daryl, that you couldn't uh, – they, they got, got back to you, and they didn't even have any evidence, or what was it? So I filed a Freedom of Information, and initially they said we have nothing responsive, and then I asked them a follow-up of – are you sure? And then they said, oh, yeah, here you go. <laughs> and there, there, there was the order, but it didn't seem to really jive with what the policy actually says of how these things go about. And there was never an official hearing before <laughs> issuing the order. Uh, so I don't know if that's something that you can actually appeal to their commission because they violated their own rules. Well, yeah. In the case with, I remember when you and I, Daryl, um, had oh, shortly after I think you moved, we both got no trespassed out of uh, out of the Keene State College, and uh, John Meyer, who's a free speech attorney in Manchester, sent them a letter, and they withdrew that real quick. So sometimes all it takes is uh, some. You weren't notified for three months. Well, yeah. well, I used to think so much of this was so hard and fast that there were rules and they were written somewhere, and everything works by the book. And then, real, then realizing in the real world that it's just adult children saying what they want and using guns and right, it's all muscles to enforce it. Yeah, it's all completely arbitrary, which is, which is you know, kind of coming back to the, uh, the other gentleman's questions about the right to travel. Uh, when the government arbitrarily enforces its own rules on us, but then completely ignores the rules on their own side. I mean, you don't have a system that makes any sense. It's just the rule by force, by men and women who are ruling over us. And I think that's one of the great parts about De Derek J's victimless crime spree is it shows that to people. It, I think it makes it clear to them that something's very wrong with this system. And of course, we don't believe that it can really be fixed in any meaningful way. Uh, but at the very least, I think it can open some people's eyes. All right, it's all Daryl here at this point. Oh, oh, uh, Stephen. Uh, five years from now, what activities do you want to look back on in a video presentation like this that have occurred since that crime spree? So in five years what do, from now, what do I want to see uh, appearing in some sort of video similar to victimless crime spree? Well, <clears throat> Right now, the best thing happening in New Hampshire is um, the 
cryptocurrency migration. There are people moving from all over the world to participate in this new economy. And I would love to see some chronicle of that happening and tell the story of these people building networks to free themselves from the control of the Federal Reserve and their, their buddies around the world. I like that idea. More crypto stuff has been so successful here in recent years, and it's only going to get better with, for anybody who doesn't know, he's now running a store, uh, the Free State Bitcoin shop. It's literally a stone's throw, basically, away from this location. So if you haven't been yet, uh, you definitely should stop in. I had the chance to go there today, and we broadcast Free Talk Live from there. And wow, what a cool little shop, and it's doing a lot to introduce cryptocurrency, which is one of the ways that people can free themselves from control without having to beg, without having to ask some man in a robe or some legislator. And I think that's what's so great you know, at a basic level about it. And we saw Roger Veer in the very end of the movie, yeah. who's known as Bitcoin Jesus, um, who's been a longtime supporter of this kind of activism. And I think that you know, when we do the, the things that we had done, and when others have done civil disobedience, it is a very personally empowering thing. But it's something that can't be duplicated easily. The average person isn't willing to take the risks that we have done. And as we've you know, discovered, you can only do it for so long. It's not a sustainable form of activism for the individual. Done in a large group, it can be very powerful. Uh, but so you, know, you have that situation where that can inspire people, but it's very rarely going to inspire them to follow suit. And if they do follow suit and they're all alone, they're just gonna suffer the same you know, fate that Derek and I had suffered, and that is to go to jail and they'll be lucky if people are paying attention as they did to us and you know, write you in jail. Whereas with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, you don't have to ask permission. You can start a wallet without begging some bureaucrat or banker or whatever, and you're instantly more in control of your life. You're instantly in control of your finances. You can keep your money away from the predatory state. It's a major increase in freedom that anyone, it's a step that anyone can take. And I think that's what's really awesome. Plus, if you introduce people to it and the price goes up, then people who've you know, listened to you actually get more wealthy. And who doesn't want to have a little bit more uh, you know, wealth at their disposal? Wealth, privacy, independence, and it's very low risk. You just download a wallet, just the same as downloading any app on your phone, which people are used to. Well, there's a lot of different Bitcoin. wallets. Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of wallets. I mean, just search for Bitcoin on your, uh, your smartphone. Blockchain's a good one. Airbits is a good one. Uh, there's, we could go on and on about Bitcoin. That's not the point of, uh, of the discussion but the, here. No, but the question was, in five years, what's the movie I want to see? New Hampshire, Crypto Mecca. I want to see that. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And that's what we want for New Hampshire, I think. That's what it is. Well, it it's getting is there. And, yeah. It's getting there. We had the Bitcoin protection bill that passed earlier this year, thanks uh, to the folks who, a lot of them from Keene, came out uh, to uh, speak to the legislature about that. And New Hampshire is now one of, what, I think two states that actually has some kind of legislation in place to protect Bitcoin only or cryptocurrency only businesses from regulation as money transmitters, which is basically the, the opposite of New York, which is cracking down on businesses like that. So we're already showing a real distinction with New Hampshire, but it's, it's a start. It's a start. And you've got senators and state representatives who are sitting in office today who are Bitcoin holders. They are people who know what Bitcoin is. So we already have allies in the, the representatives, and that's, I think, yeah. unprecedented. All right, uh, Mark Edge, go ahead. As you intimated, um, activism in Keene and around New Hampshire, to, to some extent, has changed over the last five years. I mean, the flood that was civil disobedience activism in Keene has slowed to a mere trickle I mean, in comparison. And I just want to know, do you mourn that? Like, what are your thoughts? So I don't mourn that, no. I think that uh, everybody's on their own journey. And do you need the question again? Oh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> the question again. Uh, do we mourn the loss of constant civil disobedience in Keene? That was uh, basically the question. That that's one of the things that has changed over time. Um, no, I don't, I don't mourn that at all. I mean, everybody's on their own journey, and... Um, if somebody wants to come and do civil disobedience, then that's great. But I think that a movie like this does show that there's risks involved, and it makes it very clear that uh, that it's a risky business. I don't regret 
any of the civil disobedience I did. It was very personally empowering, and I think it was an important uh, thing to do, and it showed folks that there's something exciting happening here in New Hampshire in general, that the kind of people who are moving here include people like Derek and I who, who were able to do those things. You have to be in a very special place to be able to do that, and it has always been a very, very small amount of people. We had the perfect storm, I think, of the right people at the right time. You had Pete Air and Ademo and Kelly and you know a lot of the people Bo. that you see. And, yeah, Bo Davis, uh, a lot of the, you know, Jason yeah, Talley. Talley. Yeah. Many of whom have moved <laughs> on, which is part of why yeah. things have changed. The, uh, the scene has changed because the people and the players have changed. And, uh, and like I said, everybody's on their own personal journey. Maybe some of them will journey back into New Hampshire and then do something new and exciting. Yeah, maybe there will be a time when civil disobedience will be effective in Keene or in New Hampshire, but uh, I don't mourn that there appears to be less of it now than there was then because it didn't seem effective as a strategy for, pardon? No, as a strategy for enhancing freedom. It reduced my freedom in a lot of ways and for the freedom of a lot of other people in the movie. So there are better ways, new strategies that people have found that increase freedom with very low risk. I think there's also something I'd like to add. This summer alone in Keene, I've had two people, uh, younger guys in Keene, who reminisce to me about the old days of the 420 celebrations that cool. happened, the bulk of which happened before this movie, so you know you don't really see that. But we had at one point like over 100 people in Central Square, the very same place that Derek got arrested uh, for smoking cannabis, allegedly. I guess it's, we can say it was cannabis at this point, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and It was good stuff. Yeah. They took it. Uh, by the way, just a little tidbit. I, I know I'm interrupting my own answer here, but one thing we don't mention in the movie is that uh, sound equipment that they took from Derek actually had a pipe and marijuana in the equipment box it sat in Keene Police in their station for, I don't know, months. In their evidence locker. Yeah, like months. We get it back, and it's all still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> oh, God, it was uh, amazing. I don't know where I was going before that. Oh, the two guys, thank you. for the. Uh, they were reminiscing about those 420s. And so what I wanted to point out was that you never know who you're going to touch with this stuff. And so even though, you know, it might not have felt worth it for the individual who's involved, when we did some of these things like smoking out in the police station, there's video of that, you can find it online, Keen Police, uh, with a huge group of people. And this was after they had arrested, I think it was Rich Paul or Emperor Evan, one or both of those guys. And these, these young guys in Keen, who are the townies, you know, they remember that so fondly. It was one of the most, I think one of them described it to me as one of the best days of his life. I mean, how, cool. how awesome that must have been for them to go into the police station under total prohibition and literally smoke cannabis in front of them. So obviously that's going to piss off certain people. And, you know, whether it be the townies or the libertarians who don't like civil disobedience or whoever, some people are going to get mad about that. But the thing you never or almost never see is all the people who are positively affected by it, who don't get to see you on a daily basis, so they don't get to say thanks, or they didn't know you were there, or whatever, because there were dozens of people in there. But I just happened to have these conversations that it just came up, and these guys were, they were really glad that they were there for that. And I think that's important. Well, that's heartwarming. Daryl. So uh, you mentioned a couple of legislative changes that went through. One of them that went through earlier this year was constitutional carry. Yeah. And I know that after this film, I forget exactly how long after your uh, self-imposed exile, you had again applied for a concealed carry. You were denied. You went to court. Uh, so talk a little bit about the court hearing and then also uh, since the suitable person language has been removed from statute, uh, have you applied for a concealed carry permit? Uh, that way it would be reciprocal if you do leave the Shire and go to certain states. Or are you uh, going with the constitutional carry or pleading the fifth on whether or not you arm yourself? 
That was a long question. How do we recap that? Uh, legislative changes have happened. Constitutional carry is now a thing, which means for those watching at home uh, that you can carry a gun concealed in New Hampshire as long as you're not a felon or otherwise prohibited. But a normal person can just carry a gun concealed without asking permission, which is what you were doing in the movie. You'd asked to conceal and they denied you. And then later you tried again, you got denied, you ended up appealing. Um, so, you know, Talk about that. Um, yeah, well, just what you saw in the movie. I, I was denied. I appealed. That was denied. Um, it, they said it was a paperwork thing. It, it just seems to be that it was another one of those situations where there's a law, and I expected them to follow it. And what actually happened was people, um, like judges, got in the way and said, eh, don't You had applied again, and you actually had a court hearing. You went to the Supreme I Court. I don't remember. Oh, yeah. You okay. went to the Supreme Court. You got yeah, that uh, that gun attorney who cost right. you a couple thousand. Yeah, that didn't work. Did they said that because you've used your First Amendment, uh, we're restricting your second? Oh, yeah, that's right. So you remember this a lot better than I did. <laughs> of course I'm he does. Recap this. Um, but, yeah, that's what happened. They, they said um, because you um, exercised your, your freedom of speech, essentially you were using political protest, um, that's, you know, negates, uh, like all your arrests negate your ability to be a, a suitable person to have a concealed carry license. But all that's out the window. Free people in New Hampshire and Maine and Vermont are free to carry openly or concealed. Yeah, and so... So are you going to apply for a permit? No, that I don't have any question. interest in what... I mean, um, Daryl brings it up because there are benefits to going to other states Reciprocal and having protections, carry, yeah. but I'm not interested in that. I think I learned the lesson in asking permission the answer is no. I think we got a question from Cameron. Yeah. Um, I feel like uh, YouTube vlogging is kind of a dying art form. Yeah. Uh, you hear a lot of people talk smack about uh, YouTube in general. Uh, what? Uh, how do you feel about that right now? Um, question. For an activist in New Hampshire or activist anywhere. Question was about YouTube vlogging as uh, possibly a dying thing. I know I saw Adam Kokesh quit recently from from YouTube. Your thoughts? Um, video blogging on any platform I think is a great way to reach people. Video is engaging and if you have a recurring um, like schedule of videos you can have followers who can subscribe and, and watch what you're doing if you're looking at video as an avenue for reaching people. I think it's a great way to do it and people are hating on YouTube right now because of the um, endorsements, the monetization of their videos. Um, I can understand why um, advertisers wouldn't want to put their content on certain videos. And so there are lots of other platforms. You know, no one holds a gun to your head and says you have to use YouTube. There are lots of other platforms that people can use. Um, but yeah, getting videos out there is, is good and important. Which is the reason I'm going to continue using YouTube. I mean, I'm not a prolific producer, but when I do, I mean, I'm not going to ignore the fact that there are, there are still millions of people using that uh, platform and I never got into this for the money so I'm doing this for the message I'm doing this for freedom um, you know this renting this theater costs more than you know we're gonna bring in but that's okay it's fun and this is a celebration of an amazing movie that has affected a lot of people so that's the reason that I wanted to put this uh, this together so you know yeah. to those who are looking for a paycheck from their activism I wish them the best there's nothing wrong with that but that's not what motivates me. Well, they could also do it without monetizing their videos through YouTube, through crypto. They could put a, a donation QR or put code. some kind of paywall or something to um, charge for their videos. Did you have your hand up? No? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else besides Daryl with a question? Daryl. Uh, Describe your time in jail a little bit and what it was like trying to collaborate with Bo Davis on producing the movie while in jail. Because uh, to clarify, the question was, describe your time in jail and what it was like to collaborate with editor Bo Davis, who was also at one point in jail with you. Yeah, and I was uh, visited by three activists while I was in jail. There were, um, Graham appeared in a, in a tank, um, and then it's a few others uh, while I was in. And what it was like, it was, as I remember it, the worst experience of my life at the time. It was definitely the worst. I had limited freedom, and I value that a lot. Um, I was being told what to do by goons in nasty, ugly costumes. 
And uh, I just felt threatened the whole time. There was, you know, brutal, um, muscular people all around ready to just beat me up if there was ever, if I was ever to do something that they didn't like. There were nice people in there, like the jail chef um, gave me a nice respite from the, the, out, the world in there. And I felt like I was sort of in the real world while I was cooking. And um, that was a good experience, although they would uh, wake you up at like five in the morning and just, you know, no notice, just Horton, you're working, you know, and it's like, okay, you have to get ready and sleepily walk over. And um, I don't know, I did cartwheels and stuff when I was alone. I would do, I would dance in my cell at night to the radio. Um, I had some freedom in that sense, a freedom of my own mind. And um, I, that was one, uh, threatened at one time. All of this is chronicled. The um, letters that I wrote, wrote from letters. jail, I wrote every day. Uh, they're at my website now, thederekj.com. And I think if you just search jail blog, you can see what I was writing each day. Um, but there was one time when my cellmate, who was like really awful, he had spent eight years of, his, of the last 10 in prison. And he was my cellmate, like, great. Um, he threatened me physically in front of everyone during lunch one day for taking the newspaper out of our room that belonged to someone else. It wasn't even his newspaper, but he was like reading it while he, he was sleeping and, and someone wanted it. So I like gave it to them. Um, and he had a problem with that and wanted to show because that's like the mentality in, the, in this world. Of, like I'm more powerful than you. I'm the alpha. I have to show that, I, that you did wrong by me. And that was just not the world I'm used to communicating in. So... That was really hard for me. I broke down and cried. I was over in the like gym part of the, the jail by myself. And the guards sort of like just left me alone to be by myself. Um, that was the hardest part. Um, the food was OK. I you know people are curious about that. I got to make a big cake. You know, working in the um, kitchen was the best part. And I made cakes. And I got to make with frosting pink and like, you know, deal with it. You're going to have to eat it because <laughs> you want the cake. So making, making all that and sneaking food while I was there and was the best. And collaborating with Bo on the movie. Yeah, collaborating with Bo was simple. It was just lined paper is all we had and pens, and we talked about who we're going to interview and the structure of how things went. We put everything chronologically, and Bo was in jail with me, beside me. Um, so during the days when we weren't working, we got to work together making this movie, and it was so cool. Like An unusually productive time in jail. Oh, it was great. <laughs> yeah, lots of writing and yoga, movie making. I, I, I'll just throw my uh, thoughts in briefly, since I was also in jail during the yeah. movie. Um, I had uh, a different experience. I had gone in there with the intention of having as positive an experience as I could. Now. Let's be clear, this is called the Keen Spiritual Retreat for a reason, because it's one of the probably least brutal jails out there. You saw the warden at the very end, Rick Van Wickler, uh, who is actually a member of Law Enforcement Action Partnership, which is an anti-prohibition group at the time that was called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. They've changed their branding. They've expanded, actually, since then to oppose police militarization and a number of other wow. uh, issues. That's terrific. So, I mean, the guy, he's a bureaucrat. He's impo imposing... Uh, these uh, sentences on people, and that's bad. But at the very least, he's redeemable because he's doing some good work within the, you know, the state house and that and that system. He's constantly there testifying for decriminalization and legalization and things like that. So that guy running that jail, to some extent, has an effect on the kind of people that they hire. So while you did feel intimidated, I didn't have that same experience from any of the guards uh, while I was in there. But then again, I went in with the intention of this is going to be a positive experience. And I kind of liken it to be it. Uh, I likened it to be like at, at a boys camp almost. I mean, I remember one time in jail, I was ordering from the commissary. I had, you know, like some uh, fireball candies. And the word got around that I had these and like, some of the guys in the cell block wanted them, and so I would just give out candy to some of the people in the, the cell block, and it was just, it was just silly. Some you of it was. You passed me a book through the door my first time there. You know, Murray Rothbard for a new liberty. We're like, here, here you go. I passed you a book. Yeah, through a guard, you oh, were able to wow. get a, get me a book while I was in jail the first that's time. Awesome. Like, okay, that's my friend. Here, get the, get him this book. 
So, I mean, it, it, to some extent, your mindset going into it depends. If you're if you're gonna if you're afraid of jail, if you're afraid of what might happen, then maybe you're gonna have worse experiences. Although we also were in different cell blocks at one point. I think you were in D block. Yeah. I was in R block, which was like the working block, basically. Even though you were also working in the kitchen, right? Uh, so did I, and I got a lot of enjoyment out of that t- uh, that kitchen time. You mentioned the the I think it was Scott was his name was the guy who yeah. ran, ran the kitchen, and we had uh, I think he was one of those fun guys, always cracking jokes, and really made the time go uh, quicker. And it was nice to you know get a little bit of work in in the day. All right. Thank so you. any other questions? From anybody besides Daryl. I'm so glad you prepared for this. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll talk after. Uh, go ahead. So I noticed uh, several different uh, outlets being mentioned. So free agents, thanks, but no tanks. Uh, how many of the outlets no longer exist? Yeah, most of the outlets mentioned in the movie don't exist anymore. But the important ones that are still around are ShireSociety.com freekeen.com and my website thederekj.com uh, that wasn't mentioned in the movie but that's live for your dance has cop been block is also still there that's right, although yeah. a demo who was the founder of cop block unfortunately sold it recently and nobody knows who the new owner is and it hasn't had uh, many posts in the last couple months since uh, since it was sold so again you know things live for a short time in the activist world generally and then they they move on it's I think rare and I would love to have seen thanks but no tanks stick around and it's one of those things where somebody registered that domain and then they didn't give anybody else the chance to save it or maybe they did and everybody was just like eh, whatever but now it looks bad when you know you go and you play back the movie and somebody goes to the site and it's like Chinese characters or whatever porn site or who knows what comes up when you, you probably shouldn't go to it I don't know what's gonna what's gonna come up but you know it's only 10 bucks a year to keep a domain name registered to me it's worth it for you know the sort of the, the history sake of these websites I agree Daryl W. Perry. Final question, and we'll end on a uh, more positive note here. Uh, thoughts on reviving the Shire Choir, and uh, can people still find the Chronic Carols online somewhere? Well, that's a good idea, Daryl. You should do that. <laughs> I didn't say, will you? I said, yeah. your thoughts. No, I, my thoughts are that's a good idea. I hope you do that. So I'd like to say, I'd like to add, uh, Shire Choir has never truly died. Um, it came back last year at Hempfest. And Shire, cool. Shire Dude and I, I had brought the Shire Choir um, printouts, even though they're out of date. They even mentioned free agents on there. And it's just like, the songs are so good, who cares what the branding is on the, the flyers. And so we went around from campsite to campsite caroling. Yes. So we would just, you know, pick a pick a song, and we would just just it was I'll, the only other person I could convince to do it was Shire Dude, but you know, yeah. appropriately enough, we would go up to the campsites. It was during the the middle of the day. Of course, everybody's high as hell because it's Hempfest, and you know they're just all so entertained by these anti drug war Christmas carols. And of course, we're handing out the sheets, and we invited them to sing along yes. with us as well. So we just had so much fun uh, doing that. Unfortunately, Shire Dude didn't come to the uh, Cannabis Freedom Festival. This year, but maybe we'll bring it back there uh, next year. And we've gone to the liquor store within the last five years and sang again there. And uh, so, I, yeah, I think Shire, Shire Choir is awesome, and those songs are, you know, those will live forever. And yes, um, anybody can download the song sheet. Just go to the tools page at freekeen.com where we have copies of all the flyers. Uh, sorry, we have copies of all the flyers that uh, we like to pass out over the years. So they're there. It feels good. To sing? To sing, yeah, the Shire Choir songs. Makes people smile. Sure does. Low risk, and those songs, there's something about putting words to music that makes them more impactful and longer lasting. There was a line in the movie that I I picked up uh, watching tonight where um, it was, I think... It was the scene with where Fenton Moore comes into the movie. Officer Moore comes in Ooh. for the first time. Uh, yeah, the, one of the worst. Um, he comes in, and it was at that, uh, it wasn't Huntsman, it was the other guy, uh, Santorum at that yeah. rally. And Fenton says something about, like, you were chanting. And I corrected him, and, it, and I said, no, we were singing. 
Because I can't stand it when people chant. You know, it's so typical in politics. You see the right wing do it. You see the left wing do it. This sort of, it, it just seems so mindless. It reminds me of a bunch of you know monkeys shouting. And song is so different, so much more impactful, so much more meaningful. And these are some of the things that the guy who wrote those songs, Richard Onley, who got mentioned in the film, another person who sadly ended up leaving New Hampshire, but his songs will live on, uh, that he was explaining to us years ago was that songs, there's a reason why the civil rights movement adopted the use of songs, because it touches people far more emotionally than some mindless chanting. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, all right, so last chance. Any other questions on this uh, wonderful five-year anniversary of Derek J's Victimless Crime Spree? I wanna thank all of you for coming out and joining us here tonight. I mean, wow. And give yourselves a round of applause because we'd just be talking to ourselves if you didn't show up. So uh, thank you so much for that. And, and maybe we should do this again in another five years uh, back here at the Rep if, uh, if all goes well and everybody's still here as I hope that we will be. And hopefully we can get more people out. Um, I guess I'm just curious for demographics sake, just like to see what worked. Did anybody here see this on Facebook? Okay. Nice. So, all right. Did anybody see the Facebook advertisement that uh, that I purchased? Steven saw that, but and, we already know each other. And two others who were here earlier. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. I wasn't sure about how that uh, that would end up working. Well, one of them would show up as like an ad. Maybe it's not clear when it is and, and when it's not. Um, how many people... S yeah. yeah. Might not notice. How many people saw the movie for the first time tonight? First time. All right. That's like half the audience. Yeah. That is awesome. Um, Sweet. I just want to say uh, thank you again for coming here. As you know, it's online. It'll actually look a little bit better. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't notice the, the blowing out of the projector. Um, I'm a video file, so I, I, I noticed it throughout the whole movie. Yeah. Um, but you can watch it online, and you can also check out the director's cut version. That's online. Derek did a 60-minute cut, so if your friends are time-challenged, they're like, I don't have time for an hour-and-a-half movie, you can give them the 60-minute version. Um, but you know, as you guys all enjoyed it, it's so much fun to do this and uh, we encourage people to have their own screenings you know if you want to rent a theater and show it and make money off of it we don't care we just want people to see this movie because it I think it is an important film and I'm so grateful uh, to have had the chance to make this with you thank you Thanks, Ian man. that's very sweet um, we do have DVDs so if anybody would like one these are out of print you cannot buy them at Amazon brand new anymore you used to be able to do that but you can't do that anymore. There's about a hundred of these that exist available for sale. Um, we've got a fancy signing pen, so I'm sure you're more than happy to sign a copy. If anybody yeah. wants one tonight, just come on down uh, and uh, we'll take crypto, uh, 10 bucks for a DVD. Normally the signed copies go for like 20 online, so feel free to grab this. It's got seven plus hours of bonus footage, so you get to see all of the stuff, like the scenes you enjoyed in this movie, you can see them in their full context. Uh, and so you can really kind of dig into what really happened and you know all of that. And then one of my favorite parts is the commentary tracks, which is something you can't get on YouTube. So one of them, there's actually two commentary tracks. One of them is just you sitting, watching the movie and kind of talking about your experience. And then the other is uh, Bo Davis and me and you all sitting and watching it together. So you know, you kind of get that experience of being there with us and uh, recounting and recapping what happened. It was fun. So that's all I have to say about that. Oh, one more question. I just want to say, if anybody had interested in the bikes to drive, uh, the travel, uh, driving versus bikes to travel thing, I got a thing on my phone I can show people. It's like the brief, and there's like a link, and I can actually give it to you and read it at your lead. The uh, right to travel is a very fascinating thing. I think a lot of us have experimented with it over the years, and um, I'll just add in that every time I've ever seen anybody try anything, it's never worked. Um, and nothing works consistently. So even if you can get it to work once, you won't be able to get it to uh, to work again. And um, I, like I said, I'm happy to talk about it uh, afterwards because like, some of us have had, ex I've uh, just this year actually, I had a Shire plate on the back of the car that I drive, which has my phone number on it and the Shire, which is you know Shire Society and all that. Uh, I went 2,950 miles before they actually finally pulled me over. 
and I got a ticket. Actually, I've got a trial coming up for that in Hillsboro, New Hampshire. I think it's, is it September, late September? I don't know. I have to check my, my calendar. I haven't done any preparation for it yet, so... Yeah, the trials are still going. In fact, uh, Chris, who I think has left, uh, Chris Wade from Think Penguin, he was arrested earlier this year in Manchester uh, yeah. uh, by the police at a DUI checkpoint. Uh, there's an update in that case that I'm not, not privy to speak about. So again, if you want to follow along with whatever is happening, freekeen.com, of course, uh, continues to be the best source for that. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. That's it. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thanks for coming. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.